Let me know if the mean. Oh, I the wrong side. I have the wrong side. Coming after me. No, no, you favor. No, no, favor. Coming after me. So far. Coming after me. No, no. Coming after me. But with me, never ending. I fuck up of the body. I couldn't find it. Well, you gave yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of the world. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We give you praise. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy. The Bible says, His love and His mercy, they are new every morning. I want us to just appreciate Him. It's Thanksgiving weekend. Let's just thank Him. Let's just thank Him. Let's just thank Him. Let's just appreciate Him. Let's just appreciate Him. Let's honor Him. David said, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Let's give him glory. Let's give him adoration. Let's honor him. Let's bless him. He is our faithful father. Let's thank him. Let's thank him for the gift of life. Let's give him glory. Let's honor him. Lord, we thank you. We give you praise. We give you praise. We give you praise. We give you praise. Thank you for all that you have done for us. For the past 10 months, we thank you for all that you have done in our life. We give you praise. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. You know, Thanksgiving weekend is, you know, I grew up in an apostolic church setting. We used to have harvest, harvest uh, celebration. Usually in October too. So that's the time that farmers are reaping the harvest of all the crop that they've planted. And so before they start eating all the uh, produce and start selling, they bring the first fruit to the church. So what you have is a lot of yams, a lot of uh, crops coming in and then they share it. Just like the same spirit that we have in the early church. They share it and distribute it. It's a way of thanking God for the produce. Because you can plant, but you see, it's only God that brings the increase. It's only God that makes your effort to yield result. It's only God that makes it to grow. So if we don't have a heart of gratitude, then it means we are closing the door to future harvest. So thanksgiving is not something that is, <laughs> that is optional. It's a spiritual thing. So we, they bring all those things to the church, and then the church share it and distribute it. And I'm telling you, this is an opportunity for us to also express gratitude, not only to God, but to everyone who has also been a part of our life, a part of our journey. Maybe somebody just helped you get one step away. This is an opportunity to send a thank you message to say, oh, I thank you for being a part of my journey, being a part of my life. And when you do that, what you do is you are positioning yourself to receive more. You are positioning yourself to reap more. I mean, Thanksgiving is an attitude that we cultivate about life. Life is not meant to be about what has not happened. It's about appreciating what has already been done for us. So I want us to just, in a heart of gratitude, spend a minute to pray for everyone that God has put in our life, everyone that has been a blessing to us, every of our family members that God has used in one way or the other. Let's appreciate them. Let's pray for them. Let's pray that the Lord will continue to increase them. 
Let's pray that the Lord will continue to establish them. Let's pray that their, their cup of oil will never run dry. Everyone that has been a blessing to your life for the past 10 months, every result that you have gotten, everyone that has been a part of it, pray for everyone that has been a part of our ministry. Those who have contributed to the growth of our ministry. Those who have contributed to put us where we are right now. Those who have contributed in one way or the other to make us who we are today. I want you to just spend a minute to appreciate God for us. Just appreciate God on, 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 on their behalf for us. Let's appreciate God for everyone that has been a part of us. Everyone that has contributed to our growth. Everyone that has contributed to our success. Let's appreciate them. Thank you, dear Father. We give you praise, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Father, Lord, tonight we want to bless you. This is our Thanksgiving weekend. And we want to thank you. Because you are the giver of every gift. The Bible says every good and perfect gift, they come from above. They come from the Father of light, in whom there is no variableness or shadow of turning. Father, we want to thank you. Thank you for everyone that you have used in one way or the other to help us in the journey to where we are today. Thank you for everyone that you have used in one way or the other to encourage us, to strengthen us. Father, we thank you. We bless you. This is a day that has been dedicated, O oh God, to celebrating Thanksgiving. We thank you for every blessings that we have received. And we return all the glory, all the honor, all the adoration unto you. We give you praise, Lord, and we bless you. We magnify you. We thank you for the privilege that we have to know you. We thank you for the gift of life. And we thank you for our businesses. We thank you for our career. We thank you for our job. We thank you for our family. We thank you for our children. We thank you for our husband. We thank you for our wife. We thank you for our spouse. We thank you for our brothers. We thank you for our sisters. We thank you for our fathers in, in faith. We thank you for our uh, physical fathers. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for every blessings that we have been surrounded with. We give you praise and glory. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Let's have our seat and give God a clap offering. Thank you so much. We appreciate every one of you. Thank you for all that you have done and all that you are still doing to help us do ministry and to help us do what we are doing. And I pray that the Lord will reward you for all your commitment and all the labor of love. So we want to thank everyone that joins us today and thank you for also being a part of our success story want to appreciate you and thank God for all that uh, he's doing in your life. So we've started a series on uh, dreams last week and uh, we talked last week more on the spiritual dimensions of dreams last week. So we look at dreams from the perspective of communication, how God communicates to us in dreams last week. And... Uh, Today, we are, going to, we are going to move from there to actually focus a little bit more on Joseph. Now, last week, we talked about uh, dreams, and we look at when God speaks in a dream. Now, the, that's one channel that God used to speak. It's not the only channel. Okay, dream is not the only channel, but there are many channels. But that's the channel that God used to speak to Joseph, his purpose. His plan for him, his future, everything about his life changed from that dream. For Paul, it was a vision that Paul had. He called it a heavenly vision. Now, what's the difference between a dream and a vision? The Bible used them interchangeably. Okay? Vision is more used to describe something that you have in daytime. Why dream is uh, describing what you have when you are sleeping. Okay? But the two of them, they literally mean the same thing. They are interchangeable. Visions or dreams, they are all uh, speaking to your future. Now, another one that we talked about last week is uh, prophecy. Prophecy is just words, okay? It's not picture. The first two, 
uh, dreams and visions, they are images because that's the language of the mind. But God also used prophetic words, released and spoken into your life. And sometimes God used two or even all of these three to confirm what he has been telling you. Sometimes he gives you a word, but he gives you a dream to confirm it. Sometimes he gives you a dream, but he will give you a scripture to confirm it. So in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every truth will be established. So God used different channels to speak to us. And you might say, oh, but I didn't hear God waking me up in the middle of the night to give me a dream. Oh, I didn't see any vision in the daytime to see this is what God is doing. Oh, nobody speak any prophetic word to me to say this is what your life is about. Does it mean that God is not speaking? Does it mean that uh, maybe I don't have a vision? Does it mean that I don't have a dream? Does it mean that my life is a waste? No. Because the way God communicates to each and every one of us is different. And we are going to come to this moment of discovery in a unique way. For many of us, in fact, for a number of people, for example, if you look through scripture, God used different means to communicate to people. For example, when he wants to talk to Moses that this is what I have in plan for you, this is what your life is about, what did God did? He appeared in a burning bush. He didn't send a prophet to go and prophesy to him. He didn't give him a dream. He didn't give anything. He just saw the burning bush. God just came, appeared in the burning bush. So that's a way. Now, if you look at David, how did David know what is the plan of God for his life? God sent a prophet called Samuel. Samuel went to his house, to the house of Jesse, and then he went there and went and anointed him in his father's house. That's another way. Now, you might, not, you might not get that kind of experience. So God uses different means to speak to people, but what about Nehemiah? Nehemiah was walking in, uh, uh, with, a, with a king, and when God wants to tell him that this is what I want you to accomplish. This is the purpose for which I have called you. I have created you. Now, Nehemiah didn't hear God's voice. Nehemiah didn't see any dream. Nehemiah didn't see any vision. Nehemiah didn't have any prophet talking to him. How did Nehemiah know? He just had a burden in his heart. He has a concern in his heart. When they were talking about the problem that was occurring in Jerusalem, oh, the wall is broken down, his heart was just heavy. Say what? And you mean nobody did something in 140 years? Things are at this level and nobody did something? Sometimes what you also have is a concern. Yeah. That things can be better. Things are not supposed to be like this. You see a problem, maybe some uh, child trafficking going on, maybe some sex slave going on, maybe some, some embarrassing things going on in the society and nobody does something about it. But you just feel concerned and say, oh, I think... I am wired to do this thing. Because when you are in the purpose that God has for your life, it will feel like you are actually wired to do that thing. Other people will say, no, it's difficult. Oh, nobody can do it. It has been a long time, Paul, and nobody can fix it. But you will just feel in your heart that I think I'm, I'm, I'm equipped to do this thing. So, for me, I want you to just be on the lookout. It doesn't matter how God reveal your purpose. It doesn't matter how God uh, unfail it to you. But one thing that is certain is that God has a purpose for everybody. There is no one that is purposeless in this life. God has a plan. He has a purpose for everybody. And if you have not discovered it, all you just need is awareness of it. Before you are formed in your mother's womb, God has a plan and a destiny for your life and is actually willing to reveal it to you. So sometimes also you need to know that it doesn't occur to us immediately. For Joseph, it, it was, he was 17 before he came to, to, to have that dream. For some other people, it takes longer. David was around 17 too when he was anointed in his father's house. Okay, but so, for some other people, it took longer. <laughs> Nehemiah has worked for several years before he actually come to an aha moment of his purpose. Okay, so it doesn't mean that uh, if you have not yet found it, that all is lost. No, it just means that 
You need to stay more connected with God until you come to a moment where you are so sure this is it. And you are no longer uh, beating about the bush. So today I want to talk um, on what I call dreams, destiny, and detours. Now, because um, I believe that uh, there are two important destinies that we must understand that God has for our life. Two destinies. And as we look at Joseph, the text that we read last week, I'm going to read it again and we are just going to build uh, on that from there. Now, the story of Joseph is from Genesis 37 to uh, 50. So, if you have time, you can read the everything. But we are still going to read exactly the same text that we read, Genesis 37, verse 5 to 11. So, verse 5 says, Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his bread brothers, they hated him all the more. I mean, that's not what you are expecting when you have a dream. You are not expecting hatred. <laughs> That's like a detour. Somebody is telling you about a dream and you are responding back in hatred. Now let me, let me advise us, those of us who are meeting people in the workplace, those of us who are encountering people in our day-to-day -day life, please be very conscious. When people are talking to you, you know, somebody is telling you about vacation, I'm going on another day and you are just saying, hey, can you give me the PowerPoint slide? I mean, you might be saying the right thing, but you are saying it in the wrong time. Okay? So this is a time that Joseph was expecting celebration. But what he got is hatred. The opposite is what he got. Okay? Verse 6 said, he said to them, listen to this dream that I had. Verse 7, we were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright. While your sieve gathered around mine and bowed down to it. Verse 8. His brothers said to him, Do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Verse 9. Then he had another dream and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream. And this time the sun and moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come down and bow to the ground before you? Verse 11. His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. May the Lord bless the reading of his word in Jesus' name. You know, this is not the kind of family that uh, <laughs> you, you, you are encouraged to dream big. If you start dreaming, the next thing you have is hatred, jealousy, and rebuke. You know, let's build our family in a way that it encourages people to dream. Because one of the gifts that God has put in people is the ability to dream, dream. So when we look at um, uh, Joseph's dream, I want to start from the destiny, and then I will walk back to the dream. Because when we look at this dream, his brother, they did not understand what the dream mean. His parents did not understand what the dream mean. And sometimes, as parents, we make the mistake of trying to misjudge what dreams mean. Parents are supposed to be the custodian to guide kids as they dream in life to what those dreams mean. But if you don't understand how to interpret dreams then you will make the mistake of construing what that dream means. So when Joseph was talking about his dream, his family members and his parents, they didn't understand what it means. Now let's go to the end point of why God reveals some of the dreams that he does to us, and then we can then put Joseph's dream in context. I believe that there are two destinies that God has for any believer. The moment you gave your life to Christ, there are two destinies that God has in mind. Destiny is the hand point that God has. Number one is that your life and conduct will conform to the um, character and nature of Christ. One of the goals is that you will become just like Jesus in the way that you act, 
the way that you do things. Romans chapter 8, verse 29 says, For those God foreknew, he has also predestined. That word predestined means before. Before hand, he predestined you in Christ Jesus. Before you even know him, he has a destination in mind for you. To be conformed to the image of his son. That word conform is the same word that he used in Romans chapter 12. He said, don't be conformed to the pattern of the world, but be ye transformed. What are you being transformed to? You are transformed to the image of Christ. So that means the older I become in faith, the more Christ-like I become in my character. The real evidence of growth for a believer is not years that you have been in faith. Is how much of the nature and the character of Christ is start to show enough in me. And that's very important to God because that's one of the destiny that he has for us. So he has predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son. Why is this important? Why does God want to replicate the image of Christ? It is because in the beginning, the original plan that God has was to make man in his image. Man is supposed to live on this earth as a replica of God. The one that carries the nature and the image of God. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, 27, and 28. He said, God make man in his image. But when sin came, sin corrupted that image of man. That is where all human wickedness begins. Immediately sin comes in, the first murder occurs. And that was when Cain killed his brother. And from then you have a lot of corruption that has enveloped this war. So God will have destroyed the human race. But he made a covenant with Noah. He said, I will no longer destroy man. So the only intervention that God brought was his son, Jesus. The Bible called him the image of the invisible God. In Colossians chapter 1. is the replica. He come as the new representative of who God looked like. When they were asking him, he said, so us the father. He said, if you have seen me, you have seen the father. Because I look exactly like him, like father, like son. So how does God want to do it? He wants to produce the same replica of Christ in us. So that when the world look at us, they can see Jesus exactly as he is. So the first destiny that God has for a believer is that we become uh, conformed to the image of Christ. And we will see that in Joseph. One of the things that happened in his journey was his growth process to become Christ-like. If you read the early part of Joseph, Joseph was not, was not a, a nice guy. In fact, the Bible says <laughs> he always reports his brother. That's why they hate him. His brother does something in the field. He's the reporter in chief. He gossip about them with the father. He come and report them and they hate him. Now, coupled with that, that guy now says, I'm having a dream. I don't know whether he knows the implication of what he's saying. I mean, these are people that you have already, <laughs> you have already offended because you are always reporting their bad things. Now you are coming back and telling the same people that I have a dream and I'm going to rule you. Are you kidding? You must be childish. But it shows that he is not mature. It shows that he is not mature. And so God needs to deal with him. God needs to take him through a process where he is going to grow. And let me tell you, life is a testing ground. Everything about life is testing you because until you pass the test, you are not growing. How do you know that you are growing when the way you look at things, when the way you react to things, when the way you handle things begin to change? Paul said, when I was a child, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, he said, when I was a child, I talk like a child, I think like a child. He said, but now that I'm growing old, I no longer do childish things. So when you are growing in Christ, the way you think, the way you talk, will start to change. This same Joseph that was dealing with his brother in the beginning in a naive way, when you look at the end of his life, is now somebody that God has dealt with. 
in a way that he see the hand of God in everything. God has to grow him in the process. Because let me tell you, the, the, the success of your life is not measured by the height that you reach in terms of position. The success of your life is measured in terms of your growth in the process. If it is only money that you have, let me tell you, you are still poor. The only thing that will make sure that what you have is sustainable is when you are also growing in the process. So the vision that God has given you, the dream that God has given you, is not a destination. It's actually supposed to grow you in the process. Do we get that? So the first destiny that God has is to conform us to the image of Christ. So that's why one of the things that God does all the time is to shape our character through all the challenges, trouble, adversities. And one thing that I appreciate about Joseph is that he never complained. Even though the experience was 13 years of <laughs> different experience, and we are going to look at that when we get to the details, but he never complained for once. The Bible always says God was with Joseph, and that makes all the difference. So, I want us to bear that at the point of our mind. So that's why for our ministry, one of the things that we want is that we are all growing together. That's why 2 Peter 3, 18 is our anchor for our vision. Our vision is that we may grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And when that begins to happen, your character will begin to change. The way you look at people will begin to change. You will begin to have the same vision that Jesus has for people. You will see it. And when you look at the later hand of Joseph's story, that was exactly what you see. You see exactly somebody that is not bitter, somebody that was not harboring resentment, somebody that was doing almost exactly opposite of what his brother did to him. He was not filled with revenge. We have a lot of people in church today that are filled with unforgiveness, bitterness, resentment to one another. That's not the plan of God. That's not what God wants. God wants a church environment that is filled with his love. And to me, that is what measures our growth as a church, not numbers. It is the growth in who we are becoming as an individual. Okay? Now, the second vision that God has, which will be the, the main thing that we are going to focus on mainly, is that God wants to uh, use you as a conduit through which he can get things done in this world. He wants you to become a conduit or a vessel or what I call his agent to bring changes into this world. That's very important. That's very important. So the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10, it says we are God's handiwork. He created us in Christ Jesus to do what? To do good works. So that means the moment you are saved by faith through grace, which is Ephesians 2, 8, the next thing is that God has an assignment. He has created you to do good works, which God prepared in advance. That means before you even know it, he has already planned it. He has already prepared you in advance to do it. There is something for you to do in the kingdom. There is an assignment for you. There is a mission that God has in mind for you. So, he is not changing you alone. He is using you to change lives. He is using you to impact others. And that's what we see in Joseph. Joseph was God's vessel to bring change to, the, to nations. And let me tell you, I think for many of us, we have always read scripture and just think, the only thing that the Holy Spirit is coming to do is to allow us to speak in tongues. No. The job of the Holy Spirit is to help us to succeed on the mission field. And our mission field is not in the church. Our mission field is out there. I was telling you last week, God has ordained some of us to be prophets. But not prophet to the church. Prophet to nations. He told uh, Jeremiah, he said, I have ordained you as prophet unto nations. There are some things that you would bring to nations that nations will never know about. So we see Joseph here. Joseph was not ordained to serve in the church. He was not called to serve in the church. 
He was called to the marketplace to bring an answer to a problem that has not existed. That problem will not exist until the next 13 to 20 years. But God is already showing Joseph who is going to become. Now, Joseph's dream himself was tied to Pharaoh's dream. Because Joseph's dream, if you read it contextually and, 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 and you, you, you try to interpret it, is dream just meant that God is telling him that I've called you into leadership. That's why you see, he saw that uh, some, some sheaves are bowing down for him. And he saw that the 11 stars surrounding the moon and the, 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 the sun, they were actually bowing down for him. It's a call to leadership. But because sometimes this word leadership has been abused, misused, I believe that God has called us too to raise leaders. But you see, because this word leadership has been misconstrued, and that's why his brother, they were misinterpreting him. He never told them what that dream means. He just shared the dream with them, but they were giving him their interpretation. They said, what do you mean? Are you saying you are going to rule over us? Leadership and rulership, are they the same? Is somebody who is a leader the ruler? No. But that's their interpretation. Are you saying you are going to become, to be dominating us? And to me, that's the model of leadership that we have seen in the world today. And that's why a lot of people are crying for leaders that truly care about people. Not leaders who are just trying to get into position to rule and to dominate and to oppress and to enrich themselves. They are looking for a new kind of leaders. Leaders who are God's agents of change. Leaders who are going there for an assignment that God has in mind to execute for people. So God was telling uh, um, Joseph in the dream that I've ordained you to be a leader. That's your destiny. That's your purpose. And to me, we should not misinterpret what leadership is. Leadership is not being a boss. Leadership is not you enriching yourself. Leadership is not you pursuing a personal agenda. Leadership is always tied to God's agenda in his kingdom, which is all about people. The reason why Jesus went to the cross is to save people. And the reason why we are in ministry, the reason why God has put any vision or dream in our life is connected to why Jesus went to the cross, which is to save people and to deliver them from every oppressive work of the enemy. Whether we are doing it through business or through anything that we do, the mission is still the same. So if you want to test whether your dream is truly God's given dream, just check it. How does it match with the kingdom purpose? kingdom mission that God has? Does it tie in to God's vision? God's mission. Now, two, I think I have two things that, um, that Joseph's dream is not about. And for me, we should build our dream on a good foundation if it's going to last. And if it's going to sustain the test, <laughs> the leap more test of God. Because any God's given dream will require God. So if God is going to be involved in it, the foundation on which it's built must also be right. Number one thing is that it's not about self-serving or for personal gain. Now, even though in the process, Joseph was not poor. Even though in the process, Joseph became rich. Even though in the process, Joseph has his own, um, his own life taken care of. But the end goal was not that. The end goal was not personal gain. It's not... Is pursuing the vision because that is God's purpose for his life. Number two, God's kingdom purpose is not also about fame, power, position, or popularity. It's not how popular. Even if it is 10 people that you touch, and 10 people that God has assigned you to touch, as far as God is concerned, you have fulfilled your purpose. So don't measure your success based on how popular you look. Because you might be popular, but you are already off the track of what God has called you to do. So, measure it by how you are aligning with the purpose that God has for your life. So, if Joseph's dream is not 
self-serving, it's not, it's not about popularity, fame, or power, then what is it about? There are five things that I pull out that I feel can be a good test of a kingdom dream. Number one is that Joseph's dream reveals his purpose and destiny. Because from the time that that dream was revealed till the rest of his life, that's the only thing that he focused on. Anytime you are also uh, having the dream that God put in your life, nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. It is that dream that drives everything that you do. So he revealed his purpose and destiny. Number two, the dream maximizes his gifts, talents, endowment, and skill set. There are some skills that Joseph already has. That dream take advantage of it. But there are some other skills that he learned in the process. And we will see some of them. Later on, he has to learn how to manage people, how to manage resources, how to communicate, how to manage his emotions, how to control himself, how to discipline himself. All of those things come later. They are skills that he de develop as a result of the dream because they are very important for him in order to fulfill that dream. So any God-given dream will maximize your gift, talent. God will not ask you to do something that you are not gifted to do that he has not called you to do. He will always align his calling to your gift, to your talent, to your endowment, and to your skill set. And all of us are gifted differently because of the purpose that he has called us for. Do you get that? So number three thing is that the dream provides him a platform for serving others and saving their life. He provided him a platform. In fact, when they were sending him to slavery and all of the things they were doing, they thought they were killing the dream. That was their own. But Joseph said, ah, no, don't be bitter about it. Don't be angry about yourself. Actually, you are actually promoting God's purpose. So it means if you have not done what you have done, I wouldn't have the kind of platform that I'm having now. So when you also set up a business, when you also... Uh, build something around the vision that God gave you, all you are just creating is a platform to be able to render that service. The core thing is the service, but you need a platform to do it. Whether you are doing it online on social media or you are doing it offline in real life, <laughs> you are organizing an event in real life, or you are starting a business, all of them are just platform for you to express the purpose that God has given you. So Joseph also needs a platform wherein he can save life. And there are three, three uh, dimensions in terms of what Joseph's uh, dream is supposed to impact. Number one, he's supposed to impact him as a person. His future, his own life, his own success is tied to that vision. So if that dream fails, it means his own life too is a wreck. That's number one. Number two, his family's future is tied to it. Sometimes some of us doesn't know that the dream that God is putting in our life is actually not just for us. It's also for our family. His family will have gone into famine. They wouldn't have had food to eat unless God has prepared in advance for that time that they will be in famine. So sometimes God can be putting something in your heart now that in the future... Is for the salvation of your household. When Noah was building the ark, he was building it the way God commanded him to do it, but that ark became the platform to save his family. He cannot save the whole world, but the only people he can save is the members of his family. I'm telling you, in the eyes of God, if the only people that you can bring on board are your family, in the eye of God, you have fulfilled <laughs> what he wants you to do. Imagine that everybody saves his family. The whole world is saved. Because the family is so important. So for Joseph, the dream is tied to him. The dream is tied to his family. And number three is also tied to the nations. The destiny of nations is hanging on that one dream. Because when famine was about to occur and Pharaoh has a dream, there is nobody that was found that was able to interpret the dream. Now, if you can't interpret the dream, what happened? The famine will catch you. The nations of the world, every other nations, have no resource during that famine time to feed their people. Only Egypt, 
Only Egypt, manned by Joseph, has the resource to feed other nations. So they didn't just even save themselves, the Egyptians, they actually was able to sell to other people. And God knows what he's doing. It was in the process that his brother came from Canaan to Egypt. They were not in Egypt. They came because of that. So every neighboring country came to Egypt. And God knows what he's doing. He used just someone to deliver the nation of Egypt and every surrounding nation. Let me tell you, that idea that God is giving you that looks very small, <laughs> if you work on it, God can make it to have a global impact. It might be what will fix some frictions and challenges that nations have been rap grappling with. So Joseph's uh, dream is just a platform for him to serve and to save life. And he make it clear in Genesis uh, 41 when he met his brother and in Genesis chapter 50 when he also, they were also afraid that after their father died, he's going to be harsh on them. He said, no, I'm not, I'm not in the position of God to, to revenge. I'm not in the position of God because God set me here so that he can save life. That's the purpose. So number four is that every dream that is from God will bring you closer to God, not away from him. Every dream that you have that is minimizing your time that you spend with God is not, is, is, is not the right dream. Rather, it will bring you closer. The reason is because some of the experiences that you are going through, you need God hand on your life to make sense of it. And you need God's hand in your life to make that dream come to pass. The key to success in Joseph's life was the presence of God. Everywhere you go, whether you go in the pit, whether you go to slavery, whether you go to Potiphar's house, God was always with him. And it's making him to stand out. So the dream will make you to draw closer to God. The reason is because every God's giving assignment is a partnership with him. It's a partnership. You can't do it without him. He cannot do it without you. The Bible says Paul planted Apollo water, but God bring the increase. So you might be a planter of the seed, but the person that brings the increase is God. So you need God in the equation. Anything that remove God and say, oh, just chase success without God is not a God-given dream. Do you get that? So number five is that your dream will make you grow to become Christ-like in character. Okay? Your dream. If you are running the dream, over time, you will have met several people that will disappoint you, <laughs> several people that will betray you. You get to a point that you have developed enough strength <laughs> to be able to handle all of those things. You have developed enough character. That's why even in relationship, relationship, every relationship does not start on the bed of roses. But over time, you mature and you grow when some of the things that used to move you are no longer moving you. So God also wants us to grow. When we look at Joseph, we see a man that walks in forgiveness. We see a man that has show kindness. The Bible said in Genesis 50 that he showed kindness to them. He said, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to take care of your family. Can you imagine? Because of that dream, you know, I told you that the entire uh, destiny of a family is tied to it. 70 people. You know, his family started with only 12. But by the time the dream is coming to pass, there are now 70. They are now have their own children, ch children, children, already giving birth. They have 70 of them. 70 of them, Joseph was able to take care of them. Let me tell you, God's blessing on your life too is supposed to overflow to people in your family. Through one man's obedience and success, God was able to take care of 70 people. And rather than him replaying uh, high for high because of what they have done, he chose the path of forgiveness. That's a man that has grown in character and in the nature of Christ. So now, I want to move and just uh, give us something about how do you get from having a dream to the place where God wants to take you. The pathway to the palace. The pathway to the palace. Because sometimes what we rest to with is um, 
How is God going to take me there? How do I get to where I'm going? Because any dream is giving you the destination where you are going. You have the address of where you are going, but how? What is the path to get there? We are always looking for a path to get to where we are going. So what is the path? What is the path? Now, that's where we are going to see that sometimes the path doesn't look like what we expect. Now, having the dream is the easiest part of the whole process. But walking through the path to get to the place of the dream is another thing entirely. In fact, most people give up just immediately after they start. When they, they see what is involved in the dream coming to pass, they just give up. In fact, average businesses die within the first three years. You know, the excitement is there. I have an idea. I have an invention that I want to bat. But when they start, and they have to do bookkeeping, and they have to do taxes, and they have to walk till, till, <laughs> till late in the night to get things <laughs> done, and customers are waiting, <laughs> expecting them to deliver magic. And they say, I think this thing is too much. I didn't prepare for it. So people, people give up. So the first three years is a good test whether you are going to survive. Average businesses in Canada doesn't last more than three years. Average. Average. In fact, the, the truth of the matter is that nearly the same number of businesses that are open in Canada per year is the same number of businesses that die. So if we open 10 businesses this, <laughs> this this year, expect that another 10 died the same year. Why do we have a lot of people that have dreams? They didn't get there. It is because there are a lot of twists and turns and challenges on the way. So it takes somebody who is connected to God to be able to make sense of some of the things that you begin to see. Because sometimes when you have the dream, you are full with excitement, but the experiences you are having afterward is the opposite. Of what you expect. So let's look at Joseph Pat. I have a chart there that shows Joseph Pat. Joseph Pat to the palace. You know? Now, the reality and expectations, they are different. Okay? The expectation is the day he wake up from his dream in his parents' house, the next day he will just be there living his dream in the palace, right? The next day he will just leave it. Or maybe in the next two weeks. I'm just there, <laughs> living that dream. That's the expectation. The expectation is that the path is straight. And the thing is so quick. I don't want to wait. The Bible says, <laughs> the vision is for an appointed time. Wait for it. No, I don't want to wait. I want it now. I want it now. <laughs> I can't wait. I need now. So, but the reality is different. The reality of any dream is that you will go through a lot of experiences that are not palatable. So Joseph went to the pit. He was sold to the Midianite. From the Midianite, he ended up in Pot, uh, Potiphar's house. From there, he went to prison. And before, he could get a connecting flight to the palace. Have you traveled to Africa before? You want to take one flight to get to Africa? It will never happen. <laughs> you will need at least a connecting flight to get to Africa. Except you are riding your own private jet anyway which I don't know whether you still have to stop <coughs> before you get to Africa. So, but this is the reality. The reality is that any dream, people might not tell you because what you see on the outside is different from what goes on at the backstage. They might not tell you what they, what they are putting in to get what they do. But what you will see is that there are a lot of bends, twists, and turns. And usually the journey is always longer than we expect. Sometimes you will think, oh, by the next two years, when I start this thing, I think I'll be financially free. I think I'll be independent. I think I'll be able to open five branches all around the world. Brother, it might take longer. That's why in Abacock, Abacock was complaining because he has a vision. But that vision is not speaking yet. In chapter 1 of Habakkuk, he was complaining. Why is it that there is still a lot of inadequacies, chaos, and everything? 
And then he said, so I will, I will spend some time and listen to what God is going to tell me. God said, go and write the vision <laughs> and make it plain and start running with it. He said, the vision is for an appointed time. So who set the clock? You or God? It's God that set the clock. And our problem as human beings sometimes is because we don't know how long it's going to take. How long am I supposed to wait? You don't know. That's why you have to stay connected to God and let him guide your path. The Bible says the step of a righteous man they are harder by the Lord. Now, there is a man that gave a quote I have in my slide. He said, if you can find a, pla a path in life with no obstacles, it probably lead, it doesn't lead anywhere. <laughs> if you find the path that doesn't have any obstacle in life, it probably doesn't lead you anywhere. Doesn't lead anywhere. One of the reasons why I believe God take us through the University of Hard Knocks is because that's the only way to grow character. That's the only way to grow character. God doesn't train us in comfort. That's why if you want to sit down and have your comfort zone, guess what? Nothing grows there. So if you want to grow to meet the need of your dream, there will be a lot of discomfort that you have to go through. You have to burn the midnight night. Study. Do much more than the average person is doing if you want to live your dream. So if you find a path in life that is like an elevator, you don't need to do anything. Just press a button. You are already on the stairs. It will lead you nowhere. The road to success, there is no elevator to it. You have to take the stairs. One step at a time until you get to the top. And that's what Joseph's story tells us that there are a lot of um, challenges on the way. And the thing about it is that God is unaware of what we are going through. And he knows the path that we are, want to take. There is a text in Job chapter 23, verse 10 to 11, I want to read to us. He said, but he knows where I'm growing. I think Job came to the reality <laughs> when he was grappling with why is everything going on the way it's going on <laughs> in my life. Why is it that I'm losing everything? Why is it that everything is happening? He doesn't know. But he said, but he knows. So that means even when I don't know how I'm going to get there, there is somebody that knows. God. He said, he knows where I'm going and when he tests me. Now, everything that happened to us is a test. And you cannot graduate until you pass the test. Test of faithfulness, test of character, Tells of integrity, all of those things are tests. Joseph has to go through each of them at every stage. Until he passed the test, God now put him in a place where he could be trusted with power. So God also takes us through those tests. Now, he doesn't orchestrate them. Some of them are orchestrated by human beings. But God used them to fulfill the purpose of testing our growth. So, he said... After he has tested me, I will come out as pure as good. That's the end result, character. He said, for I have stayed on God's path. So that means God has a path. You might not know everything. What you see as a reroute of your path is actually God using that thing to build patience. I remember, I mean, okay, let me finish reading. He said, I have followed his ways and not turned aside. It means I'm not trying to take my own way out. I'm following the path that God has assigned for me. Now, I, I was about to talk about um, the construction work that is taking place close to our house. Now, my wife came to pick me up the trip to our house that's supposed to take like three minutes. All of a sudden, 30 minutes, we are still stuck there. <laughs> they were redirecting us to new routes that was longer than we have thought about. Ah, I was almost growing in patience. I said, why did I leave office on time? Because my goal in leaving office on time is that I want to get home on time and start doing. Immediately, the Holy Spirit just said, well, what are you going to do? You are going to follow that same path that they are routing you. So in, in life, we learn patience. We learn perseverance when we face a detour on the road to the destiny. So, and that is what God is trying to build in our life. You know, he said the fruit of the Spirit is joy, patience, long-suffering. You will never, 
know whether those things are already there in your life until you face the test of life. Until life puts you in a spot where somebody annoys you and you didn't react based on your emotion, but you put your emotion under control. How will we know that Joseph has grown in character if he didn't face the test with Potiphar's wife? For 40 days and night, Potiphar's wife was saying, come and sleep with me, come and sleep with me, come and sleep with me. He got to a point that the woman got frustrated and said, I'm going to force you, whatever it is. And that was a test. Not arranged by God, but used by God. Every temptation is a test. Whether you are going to pass the test. When you pass it, God says, yes, I can move you to the next level. Because for Joseph... If he had compromised at that point, that would have wrecked his destiny. But Joseph said, I cannot do these wicked things and sin against God. If God has kept me till this time, I cannot do this wicked thing. And you see, the test of a man's character is who he is, where nobody sees. That's why God doesn't prepare you in public. You can be an orator, you can be anything, but where he Prepare you is where nobody sees. So if nobody is there, it's only you and God. What is it that you are going to do? Whatever you do at that point is a test of who you really are. If you are very fraudulent and dubious in private, but you come to the public, you are a saint. No, you are not one. Because God look at, he doesn't look at outward appearance. He'd look at what goes on in the heart. So Joseph passed the test. But he wouldn't have known that he has that virtue until he faced the test. So God used everything that he went through to test his character. And when he passed that, then God said, I can put you in charge of a nation. I can put you in charge of resources of a nation. And that is the goal that God has in mind. The two objectives that he has is to develop you into the character of Christ in the process. And number two, to also use you to influence nations and to impact nations. He achieved the two objectives through Joseph. Another scripture that I think is important to us is Psalm 66, verse 8 to 12. Psalm 66, verse 8 to 12 is in the slide. It says, Praise our God, all peoples, let the sound of his praise be heard. He has preserved our lives and kept our feet from slipping. For you, God, you tested us. You refine us like silver. All right? Verse 11. You brought us into prison. I think maybe it's Joseph that even wrote this for herself. <laughs> we need to check it out. And laid burdens on our back. He said, you let people ride over our heads. We went through fire and water. But what was the last thing? But you brought us to a place... Of abundance. We like the place of abundance, right? But he's telling us the path to it is this thing. <laughs> you have to go through test. Your character need to be refined <laughs> so that you can come out like silver. You need to go through some prison experience. You need to go to, uh, have some burdens <laughs> on your heart and people will ride over you. Sometimes, do you feel like you are used by people? You feel like you are stupid. <laughs> that people are just taking advantage of you. But God said, yeah. That's part of the package. <laughs> some people will abuse you. Some people will use you. Say so that's part of it. Do you know that Jesus said, blessed are you when man use you? In Matthew chapter 5, verse 44 to 48. He said, when they say all kind of things, when they do all kind of things against you, he said, rejoice. Because... Great is your reward in heaven. Because when we know that this thing eventually, even though I don't know the path that is going to lead me, but there is somebody that knows is going to lead me into abundance. So Joseph was not moved by all the things that were happening because he knows that there is a purpose for all of them. Now, the thing with purpose is that when we are in the purpose of God, when we are in the purpose of God, the things that are happening to us, doesn't look like something that is connected to the purpose of God. If I'm in the purpose of God, why are things happening the way they are happening to me? 
if I'm in the purpose of God, I mean, I saw the vision that he gave me. Why is it that the first experience I have is that I'm thrown into the pit and became naked? I became hungry in the pit. Why is it that I'm being sold as a slave? I'm not a product. Why is it that all the brothers that I have, they hate me? Why is it that all my brothers, they are filled with jealousy and bitterness towards me? Why is it that my parents, they are rebuking me? Why is it that I'm going through prison for an offense that I didn't commit? Why is it that people are lying about me? We don't see that as purpose. In fact, if it is in our own contemporary day and somebody is going through that experience, we say, I, I think you have missed the mark. I think you are doing something wrong. There must be something wrong with your life. But for Joseph, that's the pathway. That's the pathway that he has to go through to grow him and to direct him to where he will eventually get to his destiny. So sometimes the path that God takes us doesn't look like what we desire. That's why a lot of people, they give up. Because everything that happens after you have the dream might contradict what you see in the dream. But I want to encourage someone that even though the journey, because there are two things that I think you will rest with when it comes to your vision. And I want you to take note of that. Number one is your experience with people. Your dream will generate different reactions from people. Now, you need people to fulfill your dream, but the, before you meet the right set of people, you are likely to meet some wrong people. And they will do different things. Now, the, thing, the reason why they hate you or anything is not because you are a bad person, but your dream triggers an emotion, a negative emotion in the heart of a lot of people. So people is the first thing. Most of the things that Joseph passed through were experiences with different people that he made, from his own household to the people that he met on the journey. So the enemy was just arranging different people to do different things against him. But in, in, the, the beautiful thing about it is that as they are doing something, God is also doing something. What they meant for evil, that's why Joseph said, you meant it for evil. Men meant it for evil, but God turned it around for good. So the thing is that your dream is safe only in God's hand. The intention that his brother had when they were selling him is, they said, let's see what will happen to his dream. So their goal is to kill that dream. But the same thing that they were doing, they thought would kill the dream, was actually God's process of bringing the dream to pass. Number two things that you will rest to with, with your dream is time. 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 For Joseph, it took him 13 years. In fact, he was almost close to it when he was 11 years into the dream. You know, when he met this uh, butler and baker. And then he told the guy, he said, please, if you get to the prison, uh, to get to the palace, don't forget me. Remember me. But for two more years, the guy forgot him. So making a whole of 13 years, pursuing the same dream, going through different experiences. But all of a sudden, in one night, all those years of agony turned into fulfillment of the dream. And he lived from 30 to become 110. So that means he lived the dream for 80 years. And in that 80 years, he forget everything that has happened in 13 years. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. So I want to encourage some of us that maybe you are going through some experiences that doesn't look like what your dream looks like. It might look like a detour. This is not what I plan. I have a plan that in two years, I'm going to be here. But in two years, you are not yet there. And you are wrestling with time. I don't have the time. I thought by two years, I will be okay. The business will be okay. But it's not yet there. Don't give up on it. The Bible says we will reap if we do not quit. Don't give up on the dream because it has not happened when you think it will happen. Don't give up on the dream because... People are attacking it because nobody believes in it, because nobody sees where it's going, because people are even trying to stop it. Don't, don't be discouraged, because when God's hand is involved, what man meant for evil, God will turn it around for good. I want us to stand to our feet as we pray tonight. 
I have a conclusion that I have on the last on the last slide. Say the journey. Go to the last slide. The journey will take longer than you have hope. The obstacles will be more numerous than you have believed. The disappointments will be greater than you had expected. The lows will be low. I mean, Joseph can go lower than the pit. But for me, my idea is that if there is a pit, there is also a way out. <laughs> if there is a way in, there is a way out of the pit. And what took him out was Judah. Okay, they throw him in there, but Judah was the one that brought him out. And Judah means what? Praise. So that means when you are in the pit, when you are in your low, 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 your attitude during that time, very important. It's not complaining. It's just praising God and say, thank God. <laughs> I may not be where I want to be, but I know that if you bring me here, it will bring me out of it. The price you have to pay will be higher than you had anticipated, but God can also do much more than you have ever think or imagined. God can do much more. So that's why without God, we can do it. But with him, all things are possible. So I want us to just pray tonight and say thank you, Lord, for the dream <laughs> that you have given me. Thank you for the dream that you have put into my heart. Father, I thank you for the journey that I'm taking. I know that you know the way that I have to go. Even when I, have, I don't have clarity, even when it looks like the journey is too long. Even when it looks like there are detours. There are, there are redirections. Sometimes you face rejection. You think, oh, if I just send an application to a company for my business, they will just accept it. They will reject it. You have sent so many proposals that were rejected. But let me tell you, every rejection is a redirection. <laughs> God knows the path that you will take to get to the destination. It might not look like it right now, but if you stay close to God, He is able to turn things around. He is able to turn failure to success. Failure is not on the opposite side of success. It is on the same path. Sometimes you encounter failure before you get to success. So I want you to just pray tonight. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your presence in my life. Thank you for the vision that you have put in my heart. And I want to bless you, Lord. Because with you, all things are possible. Thank you for every dream, every vision that you have given us. Lord, we thank you because by your spirit, you will make it come to pass. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. You know, in the book of Acts, Peter made some very damning declarations about Jesus. In Acts chapter 2, verse 22, to 24. He said, Ye men of Israel, hear this word. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourself also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands you have crucified and slain him. But God has raised him up having lost the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holding by death. He said, ye men of Israel, you took Jesus. Because Jesus said, if you bring down this temple in three days, I will raise it up. They didn't know what he's saying. He said, our father built this temple for many years. And you said you will do it in three days. Then they wanted to kill him so that they will see what becomes of his dream. But they didn't know that in crucifying Jesus, they were actually fulfilling his mission. That's why sometimes when people are doing things to you, they are actually helping God to achieve the goal. When they were selling Joseph, they didn't know what they were doing. But they were actually buying him a vehicle to the place of his dream. The reason why we should not hold grudges against anybody is because our vision is, cannot be stopped by anybody. The only person that can stop your dream is God and you. No weapon that anybody fashioned against you can, 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 can demolish the dream. Look at all the things that his brother did. Were they able to stop it? The only thing that Joseph had after he left his brother was himself, his dream, 
and God. Himself, his dream, he has nothing. But if all you have left is your dream, I think you have everything you need to succeed, to, to succeed in life. When they met him later, 20 years later when they met him, everything they took away from him, he gave to them. They took away his clothes, he gave them clothing. They, did it, they were eating, they were feasting. When he was being thrown into the pit, they didn't give him food. When he met them, the first thing he gave to them was food because they were hungry. They came because of famine. They sold him to slavery. They make money off him. Off him, they make money. When he met them, the first thing he did was to give them money. Everything, he reversed it. And there is nothing that weakens the enemy when you display the character and nature of Christ. When Jesus was being crucified, the same people that were crucifying him, what did he do? He prayed for them. He said, Father, forgive them because they did not know what they are doing. They thought they were killing me, but they actually promoting me to fulfill my agenda. The same thing with Stephen. When Stephen looked at those that were stoning him, he prayed for them. He said, Father, forgive them. Out of Stephen came Saul. Because Saul was the one that was holding the clothes of Stephen when they were stoning him. And if not that he prayed that day, Maybe Saul's destiny will have been wrecked. If he has said, fire, fall upon them, let them die because of what they have done. Let me tell you, we don't pray some prayer to just kill the enemy. No. Because the enemy can also be a, an instrument in the hand of God to pull us into our destiny. Now, it doesn't mean that the journey is palatable. But when we trust God, it can make evil to become good. That's why the Bible says, all things work together together. For good to them that love God. It doesn't mean everything is good. But God can turn everything to end up in goodness. God is taking us to a place of abundance. Yes. But in the process, men will ride over our head. We will go through prison. We will go through challenges. We will go through tough times. There are times that you don't have enough money. There are times that you don't have enough resources. But don't let anything take your dream away. I pray the Lord will help us. So I want to speak into your life and bless you as we close tonight. Father, in the name of Jesus, I commit everyone that you have given a vision, a dream unto. And Lord, they've been in the waiting list, waiting for the time that that dream will speak. Lord, I pray tonight that Lord, the spirit of perseverance, patience, endurance, Lord, the character that they need to bat that vision. Every baby spends nine months in the womb before he's born. There is no way to hasten it. There is no way to quicken it. It has to go through a process before the delivery. Lord, I pray that at the end, every vision that is represented by those who are here and those who are watching, Lord, I pray that that dream will speak in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray tonight that everything that they need, every support that they need, to go through whatever they are going through. The same way you are with Joseph. The same way you em empower him. You make him to be successful. Lord, I pray tonight that your presence will make a difference for them. In the name of Jesus. Father, we give you praise. We worship you. We adore you. We magnify you. In this month of dreams, I pray, O oh God, that Lord, you will strengthen us the more. To live the life that you have called us unto. In the name of Jesus. We are not going to settle down in our comfort zone. Neither are we going to run away from the challenges. But Lord, we are going to step up and grow into the need and the requirement of every dream that you have given us. We are going to pay all the price that is required for success. In the name of Jesus. We give you praise because I believe that through us and through everyone that is here, you are going to be bringing solutions, answers to problems, to challenges in nations. In the name of Jesus, Amen. we give you praise, Lord. You. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. 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 God bless you. So we'll continue next week. Uh, next week, we'll be looking.